Uh, the first speaker is Casey Popovich, um, who's going to speak about the star formation and chemical enrichment of galaxies at Cosmic New. Yeah, thanks. And welcome back from lunch. Yeah, there's always a little change between the title you say you're going to give and then when you actually put your talk together and the title you actually have. But this is the one I'll focus on, which is really trying to understand something about observational properties of galaxies, and particularly the stellar populations, the ionization, metallicities of galaxies, specifically around cosmic noon, where we know galaxies are this peak of the cosmic star formation rate density, that's where the most activity is going on. I'm going to use a deep set of data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which is taken with the infrared grism, so it provides spectroscopy for galaxies over a large enough wavelength range that it studies a lot of the, the well-known optical properties that we know and love. Now, before I do that, though, I really need to highlight this is a, a very much a team effort. At some level, I'm just the one standing up here presenting some of this work, and other people deserve a lot more credit than I do for this. In particular, I want to highlight the contributions from Vince Estrada Carpenter, who is a graduate student at Texas A&M working with me. He's also a NASA finest fellow, I think is how they, 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 they call that. And he's doing a lot of this for his PhD work. I also want to highlight contributions from Raymond Simons. His work has, his his other work that he's involved in, he's very multifaceted, has already been presented by Susan Casson. But he's, he, without people like him, a lot of this would just not be possible. Um, in addition, I want to acknowledge collaborators like Eva Momsheva, Gabe Brammer, and the rest of my collaborators on something called the CLEAR team, which we'll hear more about later. OK, but I want to use this data set. This, this slide will serve as both an introduction and also to set the stage for questions we're interested in trying to answer, observationally. So one of them is, this has come up before, when do massive galaxies quenched, quench? We heard earlier today that this happens at very high redshifts. We, there's a lot of indications by studying the spectra and properties of nearby massive red galaxies that they form their stars very early on in the history of the universe and quench very rapidly. The problem is when you try to look at that today, we're observing them maybe 10 billion years after they quenched, and the uncertainties on stellar population parameters are quasi-logarithmic. And so you really want to study them when they're quenching and how they form their stars as close to their quenching periods as possible. And this forces us to observe them at higher redshifts, and so we'll do that. The other question, this is really split into two. The other one I'm going to look at are what can we learn by studying galaxy metallicities, both in the gas phase and, if we have time, of their stellar populations as well, and what does this tell us about the physics of star formation going on in star-forming disk galaxies, some disks maybe, maybe not, at a redshift of one or greater than one right around this period of the peak in the cosmic star formation rate density. So to do this, we're going to use this data set taken by Hubble. It uses spectroscopy ranging from 0.8 to 1.7 microns, where we then provide this, this spectroscopic information that probes rest frame features in the optical that we know and love. In gas phase studies, this will be very sensitive to things like ionization and gas phase metallicity using features such as oxygen-2, oxygen-3, well-known uh, transitions from Balmer recombination lines, as well as the GRISM data are very accurate and allow us to measure the spectral features in the continuum of galaxies, looking at well-known things like Lick indices, Balmer lines, things that are very good diagnostics of ages and metallicities of the stellar populations themselves. So this allows a lot more astrophysics when we're trying to divine what's going on within stellar populations of galaxies. We're going to use this data set called CLEAR. It's a CLEAR survey. It stands for the Candles Lyman Alpha Emission and Reionization Survey. It was designed originally to probe Lyman Alpha emission statistics for galaxies moving into reionization. We've been using it for other things. The data set targets 12 pointings deeply within the candles goods fields, this is goods north and goods south, where they fall are illustrated by these graphics here. And combined with the other existing spectroscopic coverage in these fields, we then probe a full wavelength range from 0.8 out to 1.7 microns in this field. The, if you're unfamiliar with GRISM data, it can be a little bit daunting. What we do is we remove the broadband imaging capability of Hubble, and we insert this grism, which is a combination of a grating and a prism, and disperses the light for every single object in the field. There's no slit involved in this. As a result, you have spe collisions between the spectral traces for objects. But that's OK, because what we do is we take the data, when we actually rotate Hubble, 
in the observed plane by different angles. And so what happens is you always have the dispersion in the same direction, or in, different, in the same direction relative to Hubble, but as you rotate Hubble, the dispersion direction of the sky changes, and that's fine. Here's an illustration. This is actually one of the galaxies in our sample. It's a redshift one. It's a very massive, quiescent galaxy. Its stellar mass is 10 to the 11. And what we've done is we observed it at three different orientation angles. In the first one, it, the, spectral, the spectrum collides with this galaxy. All the light gets smeared in this direction, and they overlap on top of each other. But as we rotate, these two galaxies become separated. It actually sits along the top edge here. We're able to model all of these simultaneously in, in the analysis space, and then reconstruct what's going on for the spectrum. We can back all that out. It requires a lot of signal and computing power, but these are the issues we've solved. These are things that we've now highlighted in a paper uh, written by Vince, um, was published this year. So I want to use these data then to get at the first question, which is when do these massive galaxies quench? And how does this process go? So to do this, we're going to take, it's a stellar population fitting method. We're going to start off with a sample of galaxies, quiescent galaxies, in this high redshift range. We selected them to be this way. They're UVJ selected for people who are interested in such things. And what we do is we then forward model their GRISM spectra. So we start off by using some high resolution sp spectral synthesis model for collective stars to represent the stellar populations of some galaxy. We've tested various things. We've tested both uh, Charlie Conroy's FSPS models as well as Bruce Charlot models. We favor these at the moment. You can ask me why later on, but they seem to do a better job for this particular data set. We then take the spectrum, which is a very high resolution, we convolve it with the morphology of the galaxy, and this is important because there is no slit. And as a result, the spectral resolution you get depends upon, very intrinsically, the shape of the galaxy. Not only its shape, but also the orientation of Hubble. And so we have to model this using the actual Hubble images we have for every galaxy and their orientations. So we convolve it both with the shape of the galaxy and then also the sensitivity function for the grism itself. And this is now a forward model, what we think the theoretical spectrum of this galaxy should be if it had this stellar population. We then can extract a one-dimensional spectrum, and it looks like this, and we've ruined Charlie Conroy's nice high-resolution spectrum. But you'll see the wiggles here are still real. These are all real. This is an infinite signal-to-noise spectrum of the stellar population if this galaxy had it. And then we go through and we can vary all the quantities we know and love, such as redshift, the light weighted age, metallicity of the stellar population. We can add dust attenuation and, and star formation history, marginalize over all these different parameters, and get at what we're trying to measure, which is can we place constraints on these properties, such as ages and metallicities. And we can, in this particular instance, we'll marginalize over the other ones, but I'll come back to those later on. Here's an example of one of the galaxies in our, spec in our, in our sample. This is just the G102 spectrum. The blue data points here indicate the extracted 1D spectrum from the GRISM for this galaxy. We've now co-added all of the data for it in this 1D spectrum. We, this is, you're seeing a rest frame optical, that's what's shown here, even though the observed frame is going from 0.85 out to 1.1 microns. The red line here is not a best fit at all. Rather, what we've done is marginalized all over all the stellar population parameters, and you're seeing the most likely value of those stellar population values that represent this red line. So there's no reason per se that it needed to go through the data. It's just reassuring that it does. In this particular case, this is one that has a metallicity of about 90% solar, and it has a, we're seeing it at a light-weighted age of 2 billion years or so. Over on the right, you're just seeing the, the two-dimensional constraint on it and the one-dimensional constraints on these individual parameters of metallicity and lay weighted age. This is just one of the galaxies in the sample. There are, in this particular study, I think Vince used 35 galaxies that he liked in this mass range and redshift range. Here's a smattering of, their, of the sample. You get different qualities of fit depending on the redshift because that shifts the spectral features in and out of the band. And so we, what the ones that we see uh, sh shift in and out, if you're a lower redshift or higher redshift, and then also the data quality can vary from object to object. But we still are able to place good constraints, or at least some sort of constraints, on these parameters. In particular, for this study, we're most interested in metallicity and, and and age. You can be then begin to make plots then using these likelihoods we have on these quantities, such as age and metallicity. This is a plot just showing these ages of the galaxies on the y-axis against their observed redshift, where Vince's sample then are shown by the colored points on here. The large circles are just to guide the eye. Those are medians where he's combined the samples together. You can say, well, they, they do a nice job. They actually seem to match well the predictions, whether or not you want to. One of the more recent uh, Millennium simulations that came out of Enrique, uh, that Bruno and collaborators used, it was upgraded to use the Planck cosmology. The thing that interests me more is the fact that at any given observational epoch, we see there's a constant offset to the age of the universe in here. 
And you can interpret this as saying, well, there's around a formation period, a period where they began to quench and cease forming their stars. And if you back up the star formation histories, and we've marginalized over them, you can say with some confidence that these galaxies had formed 70% of their stellar mass, roughly one e-folding time in those circumstances, uh, by a redshift of two and a half out to four. That's what we see for this particular sample. And so already we're seeing that even though we're able to observe these quenched galaxies out to a redshift of one and a half, they had formed their stellar, at least two thirds of their stellar populations as high as redshift of four in some case. So that's part one of that. Second part, second aspect is we can say something about the metallicity constraints. We do get likelihoods on those. This is now the metallicity of the stellar populations constrained by the data that we have for these galaxies. The individual points are shown here, and they do have some large-ish uncertainties associated with them from, the, from the modeling. You can see the median trends are up here, and then we have a linear regression fit as well, which is shown by the solid line. The small points show other studies, mostly from lower redshift. Uh, some of them are as high as redshifts of one and such. Some of them, some of a few objects extending to higher redshift. But the summary is the same for all of these. They're finding that quiescent galaxies at any redshift, up to we can see them as high as redshift 1.8, already have enriched themselves mostly to solar. And even though you say, well, there's a lot of uncertainty here, if you just look at the distribution of the medians of the likelihoods, they follow this histogram. And so the majority of them really favor having solar metallicity at these epochs. And so to summarize this little portion of the talk, I'm gonna skip over that, to summarize this portion of the talk, we find that they have formed most of their stars, at least two thirds, by redshift two and a half to four, and they have enriched themselves to solar metallicity by that point already. This is interesting, one of them is simply because, well, it seems to say that galaxies do this very efficiently, so is solar metallicity then a symptom or a cause of quenching? That's something I won't have time to go into, but I think it's an open question. One of the other things I haven't, didn't spend a lot of time talking about, because I skipped over, because I know I'm gonna run out of time, I'm gonna be short on it, is that the number of solar metallicity star forming galaxies above redshift of one is very rare. And so I think it's, very, it's still very much an open question of where are the progenitors of these objects. And this is something that Chemela focused on in her talk earlier, looking for those uh, above redshift of three, and that's exactly where we think they should be forming their stars. So there should be some connection between the two. Just to highlight some of Vince's future work, he's been updating his method now to involve not only the GRISM spectra, which we have for our galaxies, but also there's a ton of broadband photometry available from candles. We've seen a lot of people illustrate that before. He's been developing new sampling methods to, and using non-parametric star formation histories to say something more, probably more accurately, about the star formation histories on these objects. And we're finding objects, for example, that have very early star formation and rapid quenching, where this is the observed epoch here, ridge of 1.02 but they have, this particular object seems to have formed all of its stars very early on. And then you have other ones that have more extended star formation and quenched more recently. So just stay tuned for this, this is work in preparation that Vince is doing now. So moving to the second half of the talk, I wanna focus on what can we learn from galaxy metallicities and ionization that we can divine from their emission lines. To remind you what the GRISM data show you, we get things like this. This is combining all the data we have for one galaxy that we have a redshift of 1.45, where you're seeing lots of data, we haven't tried to smooth it at all, but the fit to it shows very strong oxygen 2, H beta, oxygen 3, H alpha, all redshifted into these bands, where the advantage with Hubble is that we're above the Earth's atmosphere. So all these silly effects that you have from dealing with variable backgrounds or regions of the night sky that you can't observe, we're immune to all of those. And we have very accurate flux calibration as well. And it allows us to track these emission features at different redshifts, that's all this is illustrating here, where at most, many redshifts between redshift one and two, we cover multiple species. These are sensitive to things like ionization and metallicity of gas in the galaxies. And then we can use that to, set to, 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 to measure something both about the metallicities and in integrated galaxies. And later on, I'm gonna talk about what, what the fact that we have Hubble means we can spatially resolve some of these metallicity gradients within galaxies, and we'll come back to that. Now, because we have these multiple emission lines, we've been adapting a method to take full advantage of them. It's a Bayesian method where we take all the, all the emission lines available to us, we compare them to photo, predictions from photoionization models, we marginalize over parameters such as ionization and the gas phase metallicity to then come up with constraints on the metallicity and each of these parameters individually, but in this case, we're treating ionization as a nuisance parameter and only focusing on the metallicity. Here's what we find for our sample of galaxies. This is about 70 galaxies from, from our data where we've, we've managed to do this, where the blue points show the mass, this is now the stellar mass, gas phase metallicity relation, 
uh, is really the oxygen abundance that we're focusing on here. Both we measured it at redshifts from 1 to 1.7 and 1.7 to 2.5. There are reasons we did that. You can ask me about that later. They mostly track what people have seen. We see the evolution that people have, have measured previously. This is, just bi this is just binning. I know binning is sinning in some cases, but, but we're, we're going to do that here just to help guide your eye because it also looks smoother. But we're measuring a nice result for, for a redshift of 1.4. Moving out to redshift 2.1, we can do the same. One of the things that I'm most interested in this is can we begin to combine the gas phase metallicities we're seeing with measurements of the metallicities of the stellar populations within the galaxies? This is not for the faint of heart, but I'm going to try to do it anyway because I think it's one of the more interesting things. And it's motivated by the fact that when you look at even stellar, the distribution of abundances in our own galaxy, you see this. This is a plot uh, from, from Jurek and collaborators back in 2008 of the distribution of stars from Sloan in our galaxy. You're seeing a cross section both in, in radius and the azimuthal component for gal stars in our own galaxy where you see that they have different abundance patterns. This is alpha over iron compared to the iron abundance for galaxies as a function of their radial scale length. Where galaxies that are closer in, they have a smaller radial scale length, show enhanced alpha over iron compared to iron. And we would expect things like the progenitor of the Milky Way to have these, but I'm not going to have too much time to talk about that, simply because at higher redshifts, those progenitors would have had these sorts of effective radii, and so we expect them to sit up here. We've, been, we've tried doing this. We're taking star-forming galaxies that we think are in this, this, of this ilk. They have a different range of redshifts where we can fit their stellar populations using both the GRISM data and also the broadband photometry, constraining all these different parameters. We're able to pull out things like metallicity. This particular case is a galaxy with a stellar mass of 9.7 and about a half solar metallicity. We can begin to compare that to the nebular metallicities, which is shown here. This is the stellar metallicity that we get from our constraints of the stellar populations versus the gas phase metallicities we get. And we find there is an offset. This is the one-to-one -one line here. We find instead we see that there's this offset along those axes, and if we divide those two out, if we divide those two out, we take the ratio of, of one of them to the other, we see the following, which is the difference between the nebular metallicity and the stellar metallicity. And we can call that an estimate of oxygen to iron simply because the nebular metallicity really is just the oxygen metallicity. That's what we're measuring. Whereas the, the, the stellar metallicity, the metallicity of the stellar populations is a combination of all elements that contribute to the opacity in stellar populations, such as oxygen, silicon, magnesium, and of course iron. And so this gives us, if anything, a lower limit on this quantity. And we find there is an offset. And that offset sits around here, around 0.4 dex or so. This is interesting because other people using independent methods have come up with similar conclusions. This is some work by Alison Strom. I think we're going to hear about this later in the week, which also finds uh, an offset of uh, an enhancement of alpha over iron right where we expect it to be. So that's some work we've got coming as well. How much time do you think I have? I think I have three all right, all right, we'll see. Okay, so lastly, I want to focus in on what we can learn by, with Hubble because we're able to resolve the emission features within galaxies. Because we take our GRISM data at multiple roll angles of Hubble, we get different spatial information because at each orientation, we're getting spatial information from the uh, at different slices through the galaxy. Gabe Brammer has written some code with his Grizzly software that allows you to back that up and recover where the emission is coming from within galaxies itself. This is a map of just one of our galaxies that shows a direct image. This is a wideband image from Hubble for a galaxy of redshift one, where then we're seeing H alpha, the H alpha map, and we're able to re resolve where the H alpha is coming from within the disk of this galaxy. We can do this for a range of galaxies and all the emission line properties and come up with emission line gradients. And this is interesting because then we're able to constrain the ionization and the metallicity in the gas phase within galaxies. Why is that interesting? Well, because there, there are some measurements nearby. This is nearby galaxies today taken from Manga, which show there's very strong mass dependence, that's what the different colors show, on the gradient of the gas phase metallicity as a function of distance from the center, where low mass galaxies are very flat gradients and all galaxies do in their cores, but then there's a steep gradient as you go off and that the outskirts have less metals. And this is a statement that there is less mixing, that the, the, distrib the, the, the redistribution of metals to uh, the outskirts is lower. And so we can do this for our own sample, I'll only need a minute, where we can look, go from these emission line maps we have of galaxies. Here's some examples of O2, H beta, and O3 maps. We can combine those together using the same methods to come up with metallicity maps 
And this, then, these are two examples. One shows a galaxy that has indications of a metal-rich center and metal-poor outskirts. And one galaxy has indications of a metal-poor center with metal-rich outskirts. This is work that Raymond's been leading, very much so. We can begin to make a plot of how the gradient in metallicity looks as a function of mass, and just to orient you, because it always took, takes me a while to think about this. If you have a negative gradient, that means your metallicity is dropping as you go to larger radii. And so today's galaxies are found here. If you have a positive gradient, that means your metals are rising as you go to the outskirts. When we look to previous studies, prior to what our data set looked like, this was the state of affairs, where the data are all over the place. There's some indication that they cluster around zero, and that matches predictions from FIRE, from Ma et al., that that's where they should be in this redshift range. But now we're adding something like 300 galaxies to this, to this study, where we find that by and large the majority of them sit with zero gradient, and that extends all the way to higher mass. And this is very much in contradiction to what you find in the low redshift universe. So in fact, 80% of them sit along this line. Only 10% sit above the line. We have any confidence that they have these, these positive gradients. That's actually saying something very interesting about potentially about accretion. We find some that have negative gradients, but by and large, they sit above, or they sit on the line. If we look at just medians as a function of mass, this is now looking at the medians, comparing them to the manga study, there's something very drastic changes. As we look at the, the manga results, we had this nice drop off as you increase stellar mass that they show negative gradients. That seems not to be the case for our red higher redshifts. The implication for this is simply that the, the lack of metallicity gradients in the majority of the sample implies there's a very efficient redistribution of metals in the gas phase within the galaxy. And this is going to tell us a lot. That this is likely related to the higher gas dispersions, flows, et cetera, but that's more of the discussion. I know I'm out of time. So with that, I'm going to put on my summary. I really put up two questions that I, we're trying to answer with this data set. One of them is how and when do massive galaxies quench? We're using these infrared spectra from Hubble, these slitless grism spectra, for galaxies in different redshift ranges. We find that they've formed 70% of their stellar mass by redshifts of 2.5 to 4, and they had enriched to solar metallicities by that time. Then I posed up a couple questions here. One of them is, is this a symptom or cause? Is it somehow correlated with quenching, or is it just happenstance that we always get to solar metallicity before that happens? And then, of course, the question, the big elephant in the room is, where are the progenitors of these galaxies? And then the second question was, what can we learn by studying galaxy metallicities and the evolution and also looking at metallicity gradients? We've measured the gas phase metallicity, mass metallicity relation for galaxies in this redshift range. We are beginning to find some evidence that they are enriched to supersolar values, but keep, stay tuned for more on this work. We are also detecting metallicity, well, we're looking, we're sensitive to metallicity gradients, but by and large, these are undetected in the star forming populations we have. I and mean, this seems to be implying there's a very strong, a very efficient redistribution of metals within these populations. So I'll stop there so I can save some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we just have uh, time for a couple of questions. Yes? Uh, it's really great to see people doing more of effort in the solar metal space. But this result that you have about the alpha enhancement, are you incorporating that when you then use ISI? Because there, there's really only one set of input models you can give it. So That's a great question. So, if, so I'm going to repeat it back to just make sure I understand it, which is that when we do the photoionization comparison, are we incorporating alpha enhanced models within within that within I guess of the ionizing population? And the answer is no, we have not explored that yet. So I'd love to know what direction you think that would push it. Yeah, we can try. Yeah, okay. Right. That's a great question. Okay, so while we uh, the next speaker to set up that uh, talk, we can take one more question. That is a great question. So the question is, when you take Grism spectra, of course, you're smearing the galaxy as a function of, of, of wavelength. And so there are some inherent correlations. The expert would be Gabe Brammer. I'm going to look over at Raymond just in case he knows anything more. Gabe has done a very nice job of interlacing the data when he tries to back them out to remove those correlations. I have never been fully convinced that we are. And so I think our, we do have some residual correlations between those data points. All that means is that the error bars you see are actually larger than the intrinsic errors, but it's something we are still fiddling with. That's a really detailed question. <laughs> but you're right, that's an issue we have. So uh, for and the Raymond, further you... question, maybe okay. um, any other last pressing question? If not, let's thank the Casey again. Okay.